Today we're going to our fourth installment in the Kingdom series. We've had contributions from Prophet Paul and from our dearest CEO. I believe uh, most of us were blessed. The feedback is already encouraging. God is doing a sovereign work. And today is the final installment in the faith series. Of course, faith is not a topic that can be exhausted. There's a lot more to talk about faith. But today, we're going to have paradigm shifting talk on faith. We're going to go deep in the discourse on faith. And we're going to touch things that perhaps have never been touched on the subject of faith. Some things will upset your ancient belief system. But by the grace of God, at the end of it all, we will be super grounded in faith. Hallelujah. The faith that God has been waiting for has been the faith to move the mountain of the kingdom of God into the center of the earth. So many of us believe God, but not many of us have been able to move that mountain. The Bible says you have camped around this mountain for too long. That is a parable for our generation. We have camped around church for too long, and the nations of the earth have not felt our impact. Our organizations have not felt our impact. People don't know we won't believe God. People don't even know that we believe differently. People need to know that we are a different breed. People need to feel the impact of what we believe. So that faith to move the mountain of God's kingdom into the hem of affairs in the nations of the earth and in the scheme of things in the planet, that faith, by the grace of God, is being imparted to us today, is being released in the earth today, so that people can take the mission of the gospel to the next level. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. So today, we're going to discuss the paradox of faith. The paradox of faith. Ah, I was going to do a dictionary search for the meaning of the word paradox. Now, I have a dictionary definition. Now, somebody just help me with a dictionary definition of paradox. Remember, I said every session I will do a recap of something, the reason we're doing the faith series. God has visited us to evaluate us, and he found us wanting in the area of faith. Faith in his promises concerning the season that we are in, and faith concerning the potential that he has given us. So many of us don't believe. In fact, if I tell Ike Chiku that he is born to be greater than King David as a psalmist, he most likely will say, ah, Thank you, sir. You're watching me. That's what most people think. But God has given you. That's why, and that's why you cannot ascend beyond your belief level. If you don't believe that you can, you won't ascend amount to anything. And that's the potential God is releasing this last day. Can I share a prophetic parable with you? <laughs> you know, I've been telling you people that we've not gone deep. So today I'll just give you a snippet or something. Do you remember the story of? The Good Samaritan. Most of us may not know this, but let us just walk with a plain slate and begin to re-educate us on that story. The story of the Good Samaritan, let's start from the part where the Good Samaritan stumbles upon the victim on the road. The victim on the road to Jericho. What, where is Jericho? Jericho is the city of Palms. I love where we are right now. We're on, we're on a journey to the city of Palms in Nigeria. You know what palms represent? Victory. Palms represent victory. And God showed me a vision about Victoria Island. In that vision, while we were going, somebody had broken down the Ted Milan Bridge that leads to Victoria Island. So while we were getting to the edge of the bridge, the driver stopped suddenly. And I was wondering what happened. And he said, don't worry, even if we don't see bridge, we'll find a way. So, around the bridge were vehicles that had been destroyed, wreckage of vehicles that had fallen off the cliff. They then brought them back as signposts, as warning signs for people not to cross the Milan Bridge. This driver came down, began to remove every single wreckage, and we continued our journey. And then we found an alternative road to, 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 to Victoria Island. Victoria Island represents the land of victory for Nigeria. God is leading us in the land of victory, but the bridge that will lead us there, somebody had demolished. In that vision, 
I transitioned to another scene on the vision, and I saw reporters trying to capture what happened what happened in that uh, broken down bridge. And you know what they disc- why they were having the discussion? A prophet came from nowhere and said, Thus says the Lord, these the cities have broken down, but fear not, it is the empire of Tinubu, for his time has come to an end, and he knows his time is short. Therefore, he intends to spill as many blood as possible by wrecking this Ted Milan Bridge so that no one can cross to Victoria Island. His plan is to move from the suburbs to Victoria Island. But his plan will fail. In that vision, what God was saying is this. The bridge that you saw is the electoral process. Tinubu hijacked it. The wreckage of vehicles you see are all those people who are stepping down. Stepping down for the president, stepping down for Tinubu, stepping down for Tinubu. What they were simply doing by that is to frighten others who want to step up. So that nobody will have the courage to step up. But guess what? Somebody said, stepping down for nobody, I'm stepping up. Hallelujah. That's Pastor Tony Bakare. And you do not know what God is doing. God is, is creating a new path. All of us are saying, oh, but the election has come and gone. Oh, May 29th is here. Watch and see. A new path is being crafted by the Lord that will lead us to Victoria Island, the land of victory. So back to our story about the man on the way to Jericho. Remember, Jericho is what? City of palms. And palm trees are symbolic of victory. So this man was on the way to the palm trees. He was on the way to the city of victory and somebody had hijacked him, stolen his goods, stolen his horse and left him for dead. Here comes the Levites. They ignored him. The priests, they ignored him. They have preferred relation, religion over relationship. Then comes the good Samaritan. When the good Samaritan came, you know what happened? He took him on his donkey and took him to an inn. And paid for two, put two denarius and said, what? If he stays longer, when I return, I will pay the balance. The, that parable is very important for our generation. Because after giving the man oil and wine and paid two denarius, he's talking about the anointing of the Holy Spirit for two millenniums. See, if I come back and you've spent more than two millenniums, I will add more. What we don't understand is that the deposit of the spirit that the early church received, God is about to put a top up in our generation. Because we've paid more than two millenniums now. 2,000 years have gone since the early apostles. What God is doing now is top up. So imagine if the apostles were able to experience the power of God in that dimension with that deposit they received. Imagine what we're going to do when there's an additional deposit. So when I return, I will bring an additional. So I'm telling you why in a generation where God wants to do a top up. So expand your faith and believe for more. Believe for more. That's what I'm trying to say. All right? All right. Do we have that paradox definition there? Yeah. Uh, somebody who's reading for me. So one part says, what is a simple meaning of paradox? And it says, a statement that seems to go against common sense, but may still be true. A false statement that at first seems true. A person or thing having qualities that seem to be opposites. And then the main uh, definition is, a seemingly absurd or contradictory statement or proposition, which when investigated, may prove to be well-founded or true. Thank you very much. It will sound absurd. After investigation, you will find it to be true. That's what we want to do today. Because today we're going to bust something myths about faith. All right? So before we start that, let us establish certain principles concerning faith. Romans chapter 10, verse 16. From verse 16, he says, But they have not all obeyed the gospel. How do we know that they have not all obeyed the gospel? He says, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So in this context, believe and obey are synonymous. 
Verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, indeed. Their, so their sound has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. Do you see that? From this scripture, what we are seeing is this, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. And he's saying, in spite of the fact that faith comes by hearing, people have heard and still do not believe. That's what he's saying. He says that, have been, he says, how do you start this scripture? He says, they have not all obeyed or they have not all believed the gospel. Isaiah is the one that gave us the insight by telling us that, Lord, who has believed our report? Because faith comes by hearing. But I have given the reports. They have heard the reports. They still do not believe. Even though faith comes by hearing. Everybody has heard it. The sound has gone throughout all the world. To the ends of the earth. And yet there are people who heard and do not believe. Even though faith comes by hearing. Why is that so? Let's look at NIV translation of verse 17. And the Net Bible translation of verse 17. In the, in the NIV translation, it says, Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of God, through the word of Christ. What I want you to note here is, the origin is the word of Christ, the process is the message, the conclusion is faith. It begins with the word of Christ. The inside that word of Christ, you will get a message. When you get that message, you will not have faith. That's why in the King James, he says, faith comes by hearing. That's, the first hearing is the message of Christ. Then the second hearing is what? The message inside that message. The message has become personalized. Let me use the Net Bible. Maybe that will help you understand it better. In the Net Bible translation, it says, Consequently, faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through the preached word of Christ. So, the origin is the preached word of Christ. The byproduct of that preached word of Christ is what? What is heard. Then the end result is you believe. Faith. Faith. You hear something and what you hear is based on what was said about Christ. So let me put it in practical terms. I'm preaching about the power of Christ. And how he died for us. He paid for our sins. He not only forgave us, but he also suffered for our sins. Then somebody is listening. This person has a personal experience where maybe the person has uh, committed fraud in the past or the person has committed abortion in the past. Whatever the, the case the person has done, then the person begins to think that, oh, these things I'm suffering today is because of my sins of yesterday. And he's hearing a message about Christ. And the Bible, and this, the Bible says that Christ did not only forgive you your sins, he also suffered for your sins. That's what I'm talking about. But the person is hearing their personal story. They're like, waiting a minute. Are you saying that Christ has forgiven me? This is my own personal sin? Are you telling me that this suffering I'm suffering is not because of what I did? So the devil has been taking advantage of me. Then the person now has faith. And is then delivered from that guilt and from that torment. What was I preaching about? I was preaching about the power of Christ's forgiveness. The person began to hear their personal issues have been dealt with. And the person developed faith. I didn't talk about the person's personal issues. But the person heard their personal issues. Faith comes by hearing inside that message of Christ a message for yourself. So when the Bible says the message has gone throughout all the world and yet some people have not believed is because they heard the message of Christ. They didn't hear the message that was tailored for them. They heard the message of Christ. They did not hear the message that was tailored for them. The Bible says that the God of this world has blinded their eyes that they may not see. What are they supposed to see? This is something inside the message. That's why some of them will parrot the scriptures. Some of them, their business is not selling Bible, but they are sinners. Some people, their, their business is to teach religious studies in a school. They recite the Bible for their students, but they are unbelievers. They do not believe. Because though they have read the message of Christ, they have not heard the message for them. 
So faith comes by hearing and hearing. It is the second hearing that produces faith, not the first hearing. Is that clear? You may hear the general message, but if you don't hear the specific message that was tailored for you, it will never produce faith. Everybody has heard, but not everybody has believed. Why? Because not everybody heard a second time. So now we go to our first paradox of faith. The first paradox of faith here is that doubt is not lack of faith. Because we always think that, oh, you doubting Thomas, you doubting brother, you do not believe. It's not always true that doubt is a lack of faith. If you believe, that's not mean you cannot doubt. So let's go into some scriptures to get some facts here. Let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19 to 22. It says, do not quench the spirit. How do, you do, how do you quench the spirit? The next verse explains, do not despise prophecies. You know what? If you despise prophecies, you will quench the spirit. That means when a prophetic word comes, what are you supposed to do? You are supposed to believe it. You are not supposed to doubt it. If you doubt it, you quench the spirit. It's for, for instance, if I'm telling you a story, and I, and I tell you that last week I flew to Dubai, and you say it's a lie. Do you think I'll continue that statement? Why will I tell you what happened in Dubai if you don't even believe I went to Dubai? So you quench the spirit when you doubt him. So the Bible says, do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies. But the next verse seems to contradict everything. It says, test all things, meaning test all the prophecies you receive. If you believe the prophecy, why are you testing it? If I give you gold or diamond, and I say it is 33 karat gold, will you still test it to find out it's 33, if you believe it's 33? You won't. But the Bible is instructing us to test. Who are the people who test things? People who are not sure, people who doubt. And the Bible that's supposed to instill faith is telling you doubt. Because doubt is part of the process of faith. He who believes will what? Cross-examine. He will test. So he says, test all things. Look at, it does not end there. He says, hold fast what is good. Which means there's a possibility that what you have received in that prophecy, not everything is true. So hold fast what is good. The next verse, I say, abstain from every form of evil. So not only are you holding fast that which is true, the one that is evil, abstain from it. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophesying yet. Test everything. The fact that you are testing it, the fact that you are questioning does not mean that you don't believe. It's part of the process of faith. Faith condones doubt. It's called cross-examination. Test. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 29 tells us, let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge. If they believe, why are they judging it? Let the others judge. Because they doubt it. And it's part of the process of faith. 1 John 4 verse 1. So th three. So beloved, do not believe. Do you see that word? A man of faith should not believe. If you have faith, do not believe. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By these you know the spirit of Christ. The spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. We're going to talk about Antichrist in our next series. We're plunging deep immediately. We're going to go to Antichrist teaching next. So this is like introduction. You have heard that Antichrist is coming. You've heard that. And this is the spirit of Antichrist which you have heard was coming and is what? 
is now already in the world. Since the days of John, he was already in the world. Those who are doing permutations of where he is and all of that, when he's coming, he has already come. We'll know that later on. We'll study that later on. So here he's telling you, test all spirits to know which one is of God. And he gives you indices to know how to test the spirit. The one that says Christ is coming in the flesh. He's talking about experiential truth. Those whose, he says, test all spirit for any spirit, not any mount. Because you say, but Tibet just Joshua said Jesus Christ is Lord. No, the Bible didn't say any mount or any man. It says any spirit that says Jesus is not coming in the flesh. So the ceremonies and the principles that they teach you, does he allow Christ to manifest in your body? That's the principle there. Because the Bible says the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. God is expecting that experience to replicate itself in you and I. So if after sitting under a teaching for so long, it seems to be condoning sin, you know that's not the spirit of God. If it's condoning righteousness, if it's encouraging and empowering you for righteousness, then you know that's the spirit of God. Any spirit that says, not any mouth, not any man that says, but any spirit that says. So a man can say one thing and his spirit is saying another thing. I think it was the book of uh, Titus, or it says, I think it's Titus, where he says that with their mouth, they acknowledge me, but with their actions, they deny me. Actions is spirit. With their actions, they what deny me. The Bible says, faith without works is dead, as what a body without spirit is dead. If you study that scripture, faith is equivalent to body and spirit equivalent to work. What are the actions? What are the works? That's what the Bible is referring to when it says, test the spirit, test their works. Test their works. So, I've debated a bit. Let me come back to where we are. Test all. That doubt, that so-called doubt, is part of the process of faith. If you, if you really believe, you will question it. Now, Acts chapter 17. This is where I wrap, wrap off my talk on doubt. Acts chapter 17. Are we there? Verse 10. From verse 10, we learn something beautiful here. This thing blew my mind. Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more fair-minded. The original translations they were more noble. Even if you check the New King James side comments in this place, it reads the word noble. These we are more noble than those in Thessalonica. Who are those in Thessalonica? We need to find out what the Thessalonica Christians do that make these people more noble than them. We'll go back to them later on. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness. How did they receive it? All? What is the practical explanation of their receiving all readiness? They search the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Is it true? You received your readiness, but you are trying to confirm. <laughs> they doubted the man. They said, let us, I don't ever hear this thing before. Let us find out what these people are saying. They were cross-examining them because truth is not afraid of cross-examination. So the apostles and the prophets that came to them were happy. Say, you are more noble than the Thessalonians. Let's go and see Thessalonians. How did the Thessalonians receive the word of God? Because you might be thinking these people are bad people. Acts chapter 17 from verse 1. So you are reading, we just finished reading in verse 10. Let's jump back to verse 1 to see what happened in Thessalonians. In Thessalonica. In verse 1 it says, Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Ampolonia, they came to Thessalonica. Where there was a synagogue of the Jews, then Paul, and his, as his custom was, went in to them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, This Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. 
What was the response of these people? And some of them were what persuaded. And a great multitude of devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women joined Paul and Silas. That was, their, was that not a positive response? They believed it hook, line, and sinker. They did not cross-examine anything. And the Bible says those who cross-examine were more noble. Because doubt is part of the process of faith. It strengthens your faith. Cross-examine it. It's religion that tells you to believe hook, line, and sinker because nobody wants to be... These religious leaders and Pharisees, they don't want to be questioned. Their authority is in their autonomy. Their ability to dictate things to you and you just accept it. That is how perversion enters into the body of Christ. In those days in the University of Bini, a brother went... I, I can't say pastor, but... He was, he was a pastor. He had a church. A sister came to him for deliverance and he told his sister that it is his semen that will deliver her. Say, but he needs the semen of a holy man. That he should say, he's not trying to seduce her. She should go and look for a holy man to put his semen in her. Say, do you know any holy man? Say, I don't know. It's only you I know. Because they don't want to be questioned. So they, they, they groom the people by telling them, believe the Lord, believe his prophet, so shall you be established. The scripture is true, but doubt is part of the process. You must cross-examine. You must investigate. You must know, does this align with the word? They search the scriptures to see if these things were true, and they end the report of heaven that they were more noble than those who believed it, hook, line, and sinker. So what are we doing? You think we're noble because we just believe everything? I, I, behind the scene, I talk to my disciples. And somebody will say, ah, if you, you, you said so, I believe. That's not faith. That's not faith. <laughs> you think it's faith. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. This brings me to my next point. Belief is not always faith. You think because you believe you have, you have no, you know nothing. Belief is not always faith. That's the reason it tells you, do not believe every spirit. As we read in 1 John. Remember 1 John, we just finished reading? Do not, he's talking to believers, but he said do not believe. Do not believe every spirit. It's not by believing everything that makes you a man of faith. So what is our scripture of study to explain this and to, 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 to suck this in. Before that, I want to remind you of the young prophets that God sent to Judah. And God told him, do not go back the way you came. And an old prophet came and said, God told him, don't go back the way you came and don't stay in the city to eat. Don't, stay, don't rest in the city. But the, an old prophet met him and said to him, thus says the Lord, an angel appeared to me. Excuse me. An angel appeared to me and told me that you should come and, do, and eat in my house. And he followed him. He believed him. Is that not his downfall? Don't believe everything. Question it. Doubt is part of the process of faith. So here we're going to look at the book of Isaiah chapter 7. Isaiah chapter 7 from verse 10. Isaiah chapter 7 verse 10. I want you to see that faith is not always about belief. Belief is not always faith. Let's look at this man. Moreover, the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Who is speaking? God. God is saying what? Ask a sign for yourself. Ask it either in the depths or in the heights above, which means in the depth of the sea. You can ask the sea to part open like the days of Moses. You know, these people only heard the story, never saw it. If you want that kind of sign, ask it, I will do it for you now. You want all the fish of the river to come out? Fine. You want to see the depths of the ocean? Fine. The, you can also ask for a sign in the heavens above. You want the sun to turn to darkness? You want the moon to turn to blood? You want hail to fall from the sky? I can do it. Ask any sign. Look at the response of a man of faith. And, but Ahaz said, look. He says, I will not ask. And I will not test the Lord. 
You hear that? I will not ask, I will not tell you, I, mean, I believe, uh, there's no need. <laughs> I believe you. I believe, so I don't need to test the Lord. Look at what God's response. Then he said, Here now, O house of David, is it a small thing that you weary men, but will you weary my God also? So this response of belief was wearying God. God weak. So this guy don't finish me. I said, ask for a sign. You say, I will not ask. I will not test the Lord. I believe. I agree, I agree. I agree. Those do, do what you want to do, I agree. And God said, this is not faith. You weary men, you also weary me. You don't know where to draw the line. He said, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. God gave him a sign that he will not live to see. Because God was angry. This portion is it's, it's very, it's very important for us to study it, to meditate on it. I've explained to us before why this sign was given. Because you're asking for a sign and you're wondering why is God giving a sign that he will not even see. He's telling you that the tribe of Judah is the one who will produce the Messiah. If that will happen, the enemy cannot wipe you out. But this happened during the time he was fighting the king of Assyria and the king of Ephraim. They teamed up against him. And he now went to the Lord. He didn't even go to the Lord. It was the Lord that came to him to help him. So I want to help you. So I don't worry, I can help. I don't need a sign. I don't need to ask you anything. This was not faith. He believed, he agreed, but the Lord said, this is not, you are trying to weary me out. But I will not have any of it. I will not have any of it. Many of us think we have faith. I know some of you might have the question, why would God be asking for a sign? Is he not an adulterous and perverse generation that seek a sign? Yes. We have that all over in the scriptures. The book of Matthew chapter 12, verse 38, he says, then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered and saying, teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, an evil and adulterous generation seek after a sign and no sign will be given it except. So there's an exception. Except the sign of Jonah. There's a kind of sign that we want, he wants us to seek. In, I don't want to go deep into this sign. Let me just summarize it in this place. What kind of sign were they asking for? They were asking for a sign in the depth and a sign above. They wanted to see Red Sea part. They wanted to see moon turn to blood. They wanted to see those kind of signs. And God says, no. The sign you will have is the sign of Jonah, which is what? The crucifixion of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. God was telling him, you are going to have a spiritual sign. A spiritual sign. You want a physical, miraculous sign, I will give you what? A spiritual and internal sign. Most of us seek material signs. And God is saying, that's not the way of my spirit. No, I don't walk that way. In the kingdom, signs and wonders follow us. We don't follow it. He says, this sign shall follow them that believe in my name. They will cast out demons. In my name, they will speak in new tongues. In my name, they will pick up serpents. They will eat and taste of deadly things. It will not harm them. In my name, these are the signs that will follow. You don't, you don't follow the signs. The signs follow you. The book of Hebrews chapter 2 verse 4 tells us the same thing. That he confirms his word with signs and wonders following. You go ahead with the word. The signs and wonders will follow. Did Chichi know that she was solving a problem for Sandra? When she was speaking? You didn't know. You spoke the word, the signs followed. You speak the word, the signs and wonders follow. But we have a sign we must follow. The Bible says we, do no, long, we no longer see our signs. Those signs are spiritual signs. It's a sign of the cross. There is a sign in the spirit. We must, that is our north star. That is our north. That's how we know we are on the right path. That anywhere we go, we see reconciliation. We see redemption, we see repentance, we see relationship with God. We know we're on the right path. We follow that sign. So he says, an evil and adulterous generation, you will receive no sign 
except the sign of Jonah. So there's a sign to be sought after is the sign of the Spirit. All right? This one, by the grace of God, should be common knowledge for you. Number three, paradox. Paradox number three, result is not fate. Result is not fate. Mark chapter four. Mark chapter 4, from verse 35. <laughs> it is well. It's like I'm going to hit my mark today. Result is not fate. Mark chapter 4, verse 35. It says, On the same day when evening had come, he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side. Now, when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. And other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it was already filling. Luke says they were in jeopardy. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. He was sleeping through the storm. That's what they call peace. Peace. When you have peace, you sleep through the storm. Know that there's a, be careful, there's a thin line between the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. A thin line. So be careful not to cross that line. Because you know there was somebody else who slept in the storm like this. Jonah. And that was not peace. That was a dead conscience. When your conscience is dead, it will not hear the whistle of God anymore. There's a difference. But we're not talking about that today. His is peace. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Oh, today we're not doing this. Is, our focus is not this passage. This passage is beautiful. I've been teaching on this in school some time ago. That was beautiful. Do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Be still. Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Oh my goodness. After the miracle, his response is that you don't have faith. I thought that because he calmed the storm at their request, it will be an act of faith. He says, no, it is not an act of faith. Your request will not come out of faith. And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obeyed him? Let me explain something to you here. Remember how we began our study that faith comes by hearing and what hearing of the word of God. So in other words, for faith to be activated, there must be a word from the Lord that it is latching onto. In this place, there was a word. Do you notice that? Let us go over to the other side, which means we will not die on the journey. We will arrive at our destination. A man who believes, understands that I may go through jeopardy, but I will get to my destination because the word of the Lord says so. The problem is, is that we expect the journey to look like the destination. So we begin to doubt. Christ was sleeping because he knew this boat cannot drown because this boat was floating on that word. Let us go over to the other side. If these people had believed, they would have believed that we were going to go over to the other side no matter what. But they didn't believe that. Are you seeing this? But they had results after they prayed. Because I want you to look at that situation from a contemporary standpoint. Imagine that you are going through a storm in your life. When there is no response from heaven, it looks as if Jesus is sleeping. So you cry out to the Lord in prayer and fasting. Lord, do you not care? This challenge has become too much. And then the challenge stops. And you say, wow, you come and testify in church. I had this challenge. I prayed. I fasted. I called in the name of the Lord. And it came true for me. In fact, I'm going to write a book to teach people how to call on the Lord. Hallelujah. But everything that you experienced was not an act of faith, according to what Jesus Christ said. He says, why is it that you still do not have faith? They had results, 
after they prayed to him to come and save them, and yet his verdict, you do not believe. So be careful. After the elections, and you see uh, the swearing in date comes and goes, and you don't see Tinubu. Say, so we said it to oh, God, we say, because you see results now, you're talking. Say, so you didn't believe. The window of faith is now. That's the reason the faith series stops before 20, May 29. That's the reason. I should have gone after because I wanted to teach the power of faith. But this one is also power of faith. We need to know that it's not by result. Remember what we said about faith. The first teaching was test of faith. What is the test of faith? Patience. Because there will be jeopardy on your way to the other side. So you will need to be patient through the storm. What is the proof of faith? Action. Do you understand this? Oh, we'll come back to that. <laughs> Let's not get ahead of ourselves. Result is not faith. They had result. It was not faith. Let's jump now to our last point in this study. And please and please... These kind of things I'm afraid more for the internet than for here. Because somebody can just cut just this, this sentence and not even wait for it to land. The presence of God and the authority of God is not faith. It's not the substance of faith. I know we like that. Say, ah, no, God's presence was so mighty here. You think it's by the presence of God and by the authority of God, the sovereign authority of God, to be precise. You want God's sovereign authority. And say, yes, now I believe. That is not faith. Let's go to the scripture and establish this. Matthew chapter 8. Now, when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home, paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. Hallelujah. Ah, I love Jesus. I will come and heal him, he says. He didn't say, what is the situation? Let me, he didn't, I don't need to examine the situation. I will heal him. <laughs> He's within my capacity. I will come and heal him. Verse 8. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servants will be healed. Who wants the word when the presence of Jesus can come into the house? God said you will be healed. No, make it, make it appear come heal me. He said he's the Christ. He's on the cross. He says the Christ. Come down and we will believe you. That's what they want. They want him to come. They want his presence. They want to show me your God. Show me your authority. Then I'll believe you. Look at what the centurion said. He says, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I am also a man under authority. Look at that word. I am a man under authority. He didn't say I'm a man of authority. I'm not a man of authority. I'm a man under authority. <laughs> oh. Having soldiers under me, and I say to one, go. And he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to this servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said, <laughs> to those who, who followed. As shortly I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And I say to you that many will come from, from east and west and sit with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. They start saying, but let me tell you why this is happening. Jesus Christ said to him, said to the centurion, go your way and you as you have believed. So let it be done for you. And a servant was healed that same hour. 
Now, what was happening here is that this guy discovered something. He said, I am a man under authority, not a man of authority. It's not because I have authority that they are going to obey me. It's because somebody has authority over me. That they are so these people do not, don't need the sovereign authority. I am a delegated authority and they respect me. Just the same way they respect the sovereign authority. But we don't want the delegated authority. Jesus Christ sends you a prophet. I want Jesus to appear to me by himself. He sends to you an usher. I want Jesus himself. He sends you his word. I want him to come himself. We are never... You know, you know the reason this statement also follows when he says that I have not seen such great faith in Israel is because in the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments was written by the hand of God himself. Not Moses. God did not detect to Moses and he wrote. God wrote it with his own hand. Now, Jesus Christ came in the New Testament and he did not write anything. He now delegated men to write for him. Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John write. Acts written by Luke. And the Gospels, I mean the Epistles by Paul, by Peter, by James, by John, by Jude. He began to what, delegate the writing this time around. And he says, believe this one more. And you believe the one that was written by the very hand of God. Because delegated authority is where faith is. Because he says, blessed are those who have not seen, but yet believe. If you believe before you see, it is no longer faith. If you have to see him, if you have to encounter the sovereign authority, it's no longer faith. If he has to come down from the cross before you believe, it's no longer faith. That's, the why, that's why the Bible says, in the last days, all eyes shall see him. But he is not coming for salvation, he's coming for judgment. When they will see him in his sovereign authority, it will be for judgment. And we are about to see him in a sovereign authority in Nigeria. May we be amongst those who believe before he comes. So that he will not come for judgment for us. He's coming. He's coming with his own hand. Because many people have been asking if God is truly concerned about Nigeria, he should come out. He will do it himself. You will see. Nigeria is about to experience the hand. Of, he's not sending an angel. His hand is the operation of the hand of God that's about to hit Nigeria. And a new nation will be born. From that blow that he will hit the nation. And he's saying, when I come, will I still find faith on the earth? I have chosen to believe. I have chosen to believe. Have you not noticed what happened to the, the doubting Thomas? What was Thomas' story? The eyewitnesses, the delegated authority came to him and said, we have seen the Lord for his reason. And they said to him, he said to them, until I see the nail prints, and I touch it, and I touch his side. I will not believe. Another way to caption this paradox is that seeing is not believing. Seeing is not believing. Seeing the person of Jesus, seeing the authority of Jesus is not proof of your belief. When Jesus Christ appeared to him, he says, touch it. He says, now that you have seen, you believe. Blessed are those who have not seen, but yet believe. He cried out, my Lord, oh my God. <laughs> May we not be disqualified because we do not believe. May we believe so that we may be qualified for the next phase of what God wants to do.